everyone uh, good morning and when welcome to all uh, today with us mr abhinav chakrabadi uh, who working as a regional manager in sopcon india private limited uh, he deliver a uh, more than 200 uh, workshop and seminar on technical and non technical areas and reaching the young minds in the field of industrial process engineering he has also experience of scada programming plc drives and instrumentation he also delivered the training on a uh, domain like uh, python matlab iot industrial 4.0 process automation in various uh, academics college he also uh, connect with the academia as a advisory committee uh, so uh, today uh we invite to him and he going to present the webinar on sensor and actuator uh, that a very interesting topic uh, in automobile field so i request to abhinav sir to proceed and start the presentation thank you ravind sir uh, welcome yes. once again uh, and thank you for the opportunity extended by, by paul university for the uh, conducting the seminar and uh, that's a, the topic is on uh, sensors and actuators basically and as uh, ravindra sir has uh, correctly briefed that uh, yes uh, it is a very interesting topic in the field of automobile engineering and not only in the field of automobile engineering if you talk about uh, any domain of engineering we are finding uh, sensors and actuators to be a very interesting and actually a, a integral part of the system so uh, based on the same i'll be sharing you with you certain informations uh, that i have uh, gathered and accordingly i hope that uh, the session will be an uh, interesting one and uh, if you are since uh, we are online we are on web so if you have uh, any questions or any queries i will answer it prompt at the end of the session so with this uh, i begin my uh, session for today so before going into sensor and actuators let us just uh, first of all see as to what is instrumentation why because if we talk about sensors and actuators these are basically part of your instrumentation field the core part of your instrumentation field and uh, the entire family of instrumentation in the entire family of instrumentation the sensors are, are an integral part it is a, it is a very important part apart from switches there are, yes obviously there are various types of switches but apart from switches if you see the sensors are ruling the world in today's scenario so if you see into instrumentation it is basically a branch of engineering that deals with the measurements so why we are using sensors if you see anywhere in, in any field uh, whether it is automobile whether it is uh, process automation whether it is uh, any industrial application you will find that basically the basic use of uh, using sensors uh, or any such devices any such instruments is basically for measurements and according to the measurements according to the response of the measurements we we generally try and have a fine if a final output and if you look into the output part that is basically based on the actions of the actuators so this is in brief why uh, like how the instrumentation field looks like that first of all there should be a, obviously a input that is generally gathered by the switches or by the sensors and that uh, is being sent to the processor for the processing and once it is processed then it is then the process signal is being sent and accordingly the actuators function now the motion of the actuators might, uh, might uh, differ it might be a linear one or it might be a rotary one so that uh, that differs as per the application but this is the general implication of any any device that you find any 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 sort of industry that you find you will be finding that whether it it will be starting off with a switch or with a sensor the signals from the switch or the sensor are being sent to the processor and finally it is going to the output that is to the actuators So scientific and, uh, and industrial measurements require very fast responses. As I told you, that it requires very fast, uh, fast responses. And due to these fast responses, along with the fast responses, yes, obviously, the data accumulation nowadays. There is uh, we talk about big data, right? So uh, obviously, the data accumulation, the uh, you know, the data acquisition should also be strong enough so that we can handle it accordingly. And uh, based on these things, we need a very fast processor at at the same time. Apart from the sensors. the quality of the sensors the signals that it is sending or it is transmitting we should also be very much focused on the processor speed as well and uh, it's uh, possible by the instruments uh, only so that uh, that's why instrumentation is necessary as i have explained to you
So an instrument is a, is a device that measures or regulates physical quantity process variables such as flow, temperature, level, or pressure. So there are seven basically the, there are seven parameters. I'll be discussing with those seven parameters uh, one by one, and all and the entire field of whether like if you talk about your sensors. Uh, which is a part of instrumentation itself it is basically you'll be seeing that uh, it is totally based on the seven parameters so there's nothing apart from the seven parameters so a basic instrumentation system as i already told you a sensor or input device will be a part of it the second will be the signal processor as i have told and finally it will be the receiver or the output device so these are the three parts that makes the instrumentation field and out of which we are basically focused on the sensor part and finally the output part so this is uh, you see the general the generic flow that I have already explained to you. This is an input that you get an input and uh, the sensor receives the same, same, sends the signal to the processor, the processor processes, then sends it to the receiver and the receiver uh, finally gives it, delivers you an output. And for the output, generally you have an actuator out over there. So the process systems that are generally built uh, in any instrumentation field, you'll be finding that you'll be having an open loop system and a closed loop system. You being in the instruments, I hope that uh, you're aware of both systems. So we don't go much deeper into it. You understand that uh, an open loop system will only be having a feedback, whereas uh, a closed loop system will definitely be having a feedback. So based on the feedback, this is basically the error signal that is uh, being generated, and uh, based on the error signal, the correction, the corrective measures are taken, and accordingly the output uh, is rectified. Whereas uh, in an open loop system, there is no such process as such, so the error signals are not uh, taken into accountability, and there is no summer to you know adjust the error signals. So uh, any in any process, we generally try and have a closed loop system so that we can detect the error and correct it accordingly during the course of the process. As I was talking about the parameters, so let us see as to what are the various parameters. These are the various process parameters that I will be showing to you. There are seven parameters as I have already told you. First is the temperature, speed, pressure, flow rate level position and load so based on this seven based on the seven segments based on the seven segments only you, you will be having the entire uh, instrumentation uh, field orientation and out of this if you see almost all this uh, the seven enlistments that i have made out over here you'll finding that all the sensors generally if you talk about like suppose temperature, you'll be saying that I, I, I sense the temperature using a sensor and what sort of sensors do you use? It might be RTD, it might be a thermocouple, it might be a thermistor. So these are temperature sensors. Uh, if you talk about speed, we generate, uh, tell that yes, well, we have we have tachometers for measuring the speed of the motor, right? Uh, the RPMs that we measure using a tachometer. You talk about pressure, yes, we have pressure gauge for the same. The, uh, like if you talk about flow rate, yes, we have flow transmitters for the same. We, uh, you talk about level, you have level sensors. Right, uh, you have uh, like different types of level sensors into it. I'll be showing you some of the level sensors as well. You talk about po uh, position, yes, we have head positioners, we have encoders for the same. Uh, if you talk about load, you have yes, you have load cells for the same. So, all these fields, if you see, you have some of the other sensor to measure the parameter, and this parametric value, this parametric value is basically being transformed because these are all physical quantities. If you see all the seven uh, parameters, if you see, these are all physical quantities. Uh, they, do, uh, they do not have any electrical signals uh, as such by its own, but these physical parameters have been converted into an electrical signal so that it can be uh, so that the system can respond accordingly. So these uh, these are the various parameters which have finally been converted into electrical signal and accordingly the process uh, is working. So how what is the electrical parameter that we generally take into consideration? It is either voltage or current. If you talk about voltage, generally, if it is a digital process, we generally uh, we are generally dependent on voltage source, which is zero to ten volts. And if it is the uh, analog process, as you see the temperature, the speed, most of this uh, enlisted out over here, these are all analog uh, process. In the analog process, if you see, you will be finding that uh, most uh, in most of the cases, the uh, current parameter is taken into consideration that is uh, this physical quantity is converted into a current parameter and the current parameter the range is between 4 to 20 milliamps so all the measurements that you make uh, that you do is in the range of 4 to 20 milliamps so uh, any analogous quantity will never be converted into a voltage level rather it will be taken into a current level whereas if you are talking about a digital uh, system in the digital system like suppose you are having a proximity sensor in the proximity sensor, it, though it is also of the sensor, sensor family, but in that case, the signal is a digital, whether it is zeros or it is ones. So if it is a digital signal, in that case, we generally have zero or 10 volts. 
10 volts means the signal is high that is one and if it is zero volt then that means it is zero that is the signal is low so these are the two types of classification that we generally make how do you choose a sensor there are, there are the considerations that currently as we can as to how we can choose a sensor that is satisfy the, uh, the sensor specification and accuracy that we specified so obviously the, the, the accuracy should be specified and uh, it should meet the constraints it should be reliable the measurement should be reliable it should be a robust system simple to use so based on these criteria we generally go for the choosing of the sensor instrumentation plays an important role in almost all aspects of automation technology so if you talk about whether it is automobile or whether it is any field, automation is an integral part of all the fields and yes, uh, instrumentation, all the sensors and actuators are playing a very important role in the team. So the things that it measures, yes, already it has been enlisted, pressure, temperature, level flow, as I have already showed you, the, uh, the seven parameters, based on the seven parameters only, the enlistment has been made out over here. Devices that uh, process or do the uh, measuring, that is uh, the device that are doing the measuring, are basically called to the sensors or the transducers, transmitters, indicators, uh, displays. Why indicators? Indicators because when you are going for a digital signal, generally using an indicator, you can go uh, go to depict whether it is a high signal or it is a low signal. So that is why indicators are also mentioned. Displays, the displays obviously the screens uh, on which you can see the readings and everything. Recorders, recorders uh, because you want to keep a database. Data loggers, again the same thing. Loggers are for uh, fetching in any previous data. Like suppose, uh, like if you talked about in modern day system. You generally try and have a data acquisition system so if you're having a data acquisition system at the same time you should be able to log in the data that is fetching some previous information and apart from that yes you are always having the data acquisition system so these are the all the um, instruments that we are generally talking about which helps uh, in the process of measuring which helps in the process of measuring of keeping the database Transistors generally converts one form of energy to, uh, to another, mechanical to electrical or vice versa, yes, obviously. It converts mechanical force to electrical signal, parameters such as heat. So obviously when you are talking about, that is why I told you, you when I was talking about flow uh, level, uh, I, I said that it is a level sensor, but when I was talking about flow, I, say, I said that it, it was flow transmitters or flow, uh, flow transducers or rather pressure transducers. Why pressure transducers? Because pressure is such a quantity which can never be digital it has to be always analogous right and since it is analogous what you have to do is that you have to convert it into an electrical signal and since we are converting a physical quantity that is pressure which is totally a physical quantity into an electrical quantity so obviously we call it to be a pressure transducer right though it is basically doing the work of measuring the pressure so you can always call it to be a pressure sensor but since it is being directly converted it is an analogous quantity being converted into electrical signal so we call it to be a pressure transducer Transmitters. Transmitter is an electronic uh, device that is generally mounted uh, in the field in close proximity to a sensor. The sensor, also, also known as the transducer, as I have already told you, we do not call it to be a sensor, we call it to be a transducer. So uh, the, the sensor, also known as the transducer, measures the physical variables such as temperature or pressure and outputs are very lo uh, low level electronic signals. So as I have told you, it is being converted into the electronic signal by the transducer. Now the transmitter is taking it. Now the transmitter is taking the same. The basic function of the transmitter is to provide the correct electrical power to turn or excite the sensor, then to read the low level signal, amplify it to a higher electrical signal and send the, that signal to a long distance to control and treat out the device. So what we are doing is that through the transmitter, we are converting the electrical, we are converting the physical quantity into electrical signal, which is a very low, as I have told you, 4 to 20 milliamps means it is a very low electrical signal. And that low electrical signal is being again amplified by, with the help of a transmitter. And then it is being transmitted means transmits. It transmits the signal, the physical quantity signal, which has already been converted into electrical signal by the transducer, is being amplified by the transmitter and being sent over the long distance for the reception, reception of the data and accordingly the further function it takes place. The types of transmitters. So you have two-way transmitters, three-way transmitters, and four-way transmitters. So these are the four, uh, like three basic types of tra transmitters that you have. <clears throat> Don't be going much details into the transmitter part, by because uh, 
we have uh, topics to cover, but uh, these are the three types of transmitters that uh, you generally have in your systems. And if you see over here, yes, this is the important point to focus on that it is the 4 to 20 milliamps can supply the internal circuitry, right? So two, whether it is two-way system, three-way system, or four-way system, you'll be needing this 4 to 20 milliamps range to work upon. The, the basic difference uh, between the two-way, three-way, and the four-way transmitter: in two-way transmitter, the power the powers and signal are transmitted through same cable. Why? Because you have only two wires, so power and signal are transmitted through the same cable. Whereas if you look into the three-way transmitter, what is happening is that the data, the data signal and power with respect to common ground. Why? Because you have three wires. So out of the three wires, basically one is acting as the ground, one is acting as a data a, a data signal, and the other wire is carrying the power. Whereas in the four wire, two wires for power supply and two for signals. So in the four wire system, the signal and the power are totally uh, different. The signal carrying wires and power carrying wires are totally different. Whereas in the uh, three wire system, you have a common ground. Whereas in the two wire system, you know, uh, the signal as well as the power carrying wires are, are both the same. The cables are both the same. If you look at the digital inputs, yes, as I have already told you, the switches, that is the push buttons and limit switches, read switches, out of which uh, the short switches, these are all digital type, but actually if you see, we call it to be switches, but the functionality, if you see, these are also type of sensors, apart from your push buttons. Apart from your push buttons, if you see, this push button, you have to press it uh, mechanically and uh, accordingly it responds. But apart from that, if you see the float switches and all, uh, the photoelectric uh, electronic sensor if you talk about these are basically sensors but we categorize we categorize it under uh, like uh, under digital under digital inputs because it is only acting as zeros and ones whether it is on or either it is off it won't give you, it won't be giving you a range of values it, uh, like if you talk about float switches using the float switches it, it is only used like uh, the common example of float switches you'll be finding at your uh, house whereby in the uh, overhead tanks you have an alarm system. Once your overhead tank is full, there's an alarm that has been generated. So uh, th that is the basic example of a float switch. Float switch means it is floating, and as as soon as it comes in contact with a particular level of a liquid, it generates an alarm or it generates a signal. So the signal will be generated only when the level is full. The signal will be generated only when the level is full. So only at tank being hundred percent, the alarm turns to be one. And if the level of uh, tank is below 100%, then in that case, the alarm system, the, if you talk about the alarm system, the alarm system will be low. So there are only two responses of the alarm system, that is whether it is zeros or whether it is ones. So that is why it is under the digital category. But these are also acting as sensors. You talk about a photoelectric or IR sensors, in that also the IR sensor, your, your TV signal, your TV remote, you're pressing once, the power is on. You're pressing again, the power is off. So what is happening through the IR uh, sensor, you are basically transmitting a signal to switch on or to switch off your television. Again, it is the same, zeros or ones. So all these examples, if you see understood over here, the limit switches, limit means a particular load can be carried on uh, on it. Beyond that load, there'll be a contact, uh, there'll be make or break of the contact. So make of the contact or break of the contact means again, zeros or ones. Read switch, it is an electromagnetic switch yet again, which is making a contact, or breaking and so all these examples are listed over here are acting on zeros and ones your proximity sensors proximity sensor it is basically again a three wide uh, sensor in which what what you are doing is that you have a common example like your lifts you you place something in between the doors of your lift the doors do not close even in your uh, metros you see the same thing the doors of the metros do not close if you are standing in between so that is being sensed by your proximity sensor Proximation means something near about, something nearby. If something is nearby in the range of that particular sensor, the sensor responds. And if there's nothing uh, in, in that range, the sensor won't respond. So again, there are two cases. Either it will respond, that is one, or either or it will not respond, that is zero. So again, it is only zeros and ones. So all this uh, list of sensors that I'm discussing, they're all under the digital category. Digital outputs we are not much concerned about, but still, uh, if you talk about these are the relays, contactors, and sonar bulbs, based on which the, your uh, actuators will perform. Analog inputs, temperature, level, flow. As uh, all you can again see that almost all those seven parameters, 
all the seven parameters that we have picked up earlier these are being discussed out over here yet again so these are your analog inputs these are your analog sensors basically so we have already discussed about the digital sensors these are your analog sensors now if you see into your analog outputs your analog outputs are control valves and your drives so drives means basically it is a the through the drives that is the vfds if you talk about variable frequency drives you're basically driving your motor so the motor is again a part of your actuator that is your it is a rotary motion it is a rotary motion whereas if you talk about the control valves sometimes some of the control valves have a, like your pin valves these are having a linear motion your linear actuator these are your linear actuators so in the family of your analog outputs you will see you, you might be having your linear or you might be having your rotary actuators Look into your digital uh, inputs in your digital inputs you will be seeing that generally we start off with the switch so it, uh, see the switches uh, are basically something in the like sensors we always know that uh, we are using sensors because we want to make it work in a, uh, in a remote atmosphere but if you want to work in a local atmosphere in a local control panel you can always go for switches so switches are nothing but uh, these are, uh, these are a component, these are basically an electronic component that can make or break a circuit. So for making or breaking the circuit locally, you can use the switches and for if it is from a remote location, then we go for the sensors part. Yes, and, uh, switches can work both on ACs and DCs, that's true. Most common type of switch, if you see in the industry, you'll be finding a push button, that is your NOs and NCs. These are the various categories of your switches. As I have already told you, NOA and NC push button that is normally open and normally closed push buttons. Limit switch. Now, uh, from here, basically starts the journey of our sensors because uh, these are not. As far as the, your push buttons are concerned, these are physically uh, physical switches which someone was operating, which a uh, operator was operating. But from here, if you start with the limit switches, these are all made to to uh, perform automatically. And most of the, in most of the cases, the switches are electromechanical basically. So uh, in electrical engineering, a limit switch is a switch operated in, by the motion of a machine part or presence of an object. So if anything, as I already told you, limit means it is limiting the load on a particular uh, on a particular uh, instance. Like the the best example of the limit switch, if you see uh, the way bridge, the way the way bridge uh, by the side of your uh, road that you see for measuring the weight of the trucks, the loaded trucks, that is also a part of the limit switch. You have load, you have uh, limit, uh, you have switches, uh, you have load cells pla uh, placed below the plate, and accordingly the spring contracts and accordingly it responds. So similar sort of a function is uh, being happening with your limit switches out over here as well. As you can see, this is the C. This is the limit switch A. This is the limit switch B, and this is the belt. This is the belt. So over here, if you're if you're pressing some load, if you're placing some load out over here, accordingly, what is uh, what is happening is that the motor controller is responding. Right. So if there is no load, obviously there will be uh, this this uh, separation won't be there. It will be in contact. As the load is being increased, the uh, the belt uh, it comes uh, down due to the weight. And due to which the response happens. The read switch. If you talk about your read switch, uh, in the read switch, you, as I have already told you, it is basically the electromagnetic uh, phenomena that happens. You can see that there are two ferromagnetic plates. So you can understand it is an electromagnetic phenomena. If there, if at all there is a supply being given, accordingly it contracts. And if there is no supply, then there will be no con uh, conducting. So the read switch is again a type of your uh, electromechanical switch itself. Uh, so what is basically read sensor? The basic read sensor uh, switch consists of two identical flattened ferromagnetic reads, as I have already told you, sealed in a dry inert gas atmosphere within a glass capsule, as I have shown you in the picture as well, thereby protecting the uh, contact from contaminating. So uh, if uh, the contact is contaminated, then in that case, uh, it might not make a contact. So that is why this uh, glass uh, uh, envelope has been made, so that uh, it does not contaminate. The reads are sealed in the capsule uh, in cantilever form so that uh, their free ends overlap and are separated by a small air gap. 
in between. This small air gap is basically to uh, to avoid the contact. And as soon as it is charged, so accordingly the contact will be made. So you can see over here that there is an overlap, but there is a small gap in between. This is the contact gap. And as, as it contacts, so accordingly the circuit is completed. This read switch are used in your automobile industry. So we'll be finding that it is generally used in your automobile industry at various points. So th this is a very important part of, um, of your uh, automobile field applications. In, in any part you see, you'll be, uh, like uh, for your speedometers or for uh, anything as such, you'll be having your uh, read switch. If the read switch is not conducting, that means it goes to show that there, there are certain defects, there are certain problems. All these metering uh, all units that you have in your dashboard of your car, uh, in almost all the components in almost all the parts, you'll be having a read switch as well. So this read switch uh, will uh, will make or break the contact. And if uh, like the circuit is completed, so it is everything is uh, perfect. So the read switch will be in contact, and that is why we get the readings on our uh, various metering units on our dashboard. So you can see uh, auto door locks. Auto, uh, auto speed, power steering, engine control, all the speed sensors. In all the speed sensors, you're having your read switch connected. Apart from that, if you, if you see, uh, look into your float, engine, flo uh, engine oil float, in that also you have a read switch. Now comes the float switches. This is the type of float switches. Uh, these are two types that I have shown. This is the industrial type, uh, and uh, the left hand side, if you see, uh, on my screen that is basically an industrial type and uh, if you are using for your normal small project applications you'll be finding the one on the right hand side the cheap uh, these are quite cheap uh, easily available in the market and uh, th this rod give uh, give you the levels it just gives you the make or break of the circuit at a particular point these are basically used for measuring the level of the fluid itself to create the level of the fluid but the detection of the level of the fluid is as such that when it when the level of the fluid reaches a particular point and touches and touches this sensor and touches the sensor you can see that it is uh, there are two parts into it so once these two makes contact i will just use just use the pen so once this two makes a contact it drones over here and it makes a contact the circuit is complete and for that what will happen is that obviously as the liquid comes to this level as the liquid comes to this level and gradually starts increasing so uh, this this part this particular part will also move in the upward direction and as it moves in the upward direction as it moves in the upward direction gradually there will be a point where this two this two will make a contact and if this two makes a contact then the circuit is complete and accordingly your alarm turns to be high photoelectric sensor that is the ir sensors very common example these are basically of two types there is a single base and a double base if you find the single base in the single base what happens is that the tx and the rx that is the transmitter and the receiver are both at the same end over here you can see that the single base whereby the transmitter and the receivers are both at the same end so the tx is sending a signal a signal which is striking a particular surface and again coming back and uh, the rx is receiving so uh, in this case uh, i can give you another example of a similar type that is your ultrasonic system the ultrasonic sensors they are also responding in a similar type you might you might have seen uh, sometimes uh, making your small robots like suppose your line follower robots or you might be uh, making your edge follower robots in that you have an ir pair that uh, that is being connected and through the ir pair only you uh, you get the uh, like sensations of the, the robot movement if it is a line follower robot you will be seeing that it is following the black line or it is following the white line and it is uh, you say that based on the ir sensors that is connected on the head of the uh, robot so if you see in that you'll be finding a glass uh, module sort of which is black and the other is transparent so that is the ir pair so one is the tx and the other is the rx how it works is that the tx is sending in the signal which gets and which strikes the surface the, the white surface or the black surface and accordingly the signal is being received by the rx so that is a single wave system 
whereas if you talk about your te television systems your television remotes in that also you have an ir sensor but in that ir sensor if you see that is a double base why it is double base in your tv remote you will be finding the white part that is the transparent part whereas in your tv module in your tv uh, cabinet you will be finding that there is a black module so the tx is in your hand and the rx is in the tv cabinet so that is your double base so the tx is sending the signal and the rx is directly receiving the signal so there is nothing as such whereby it is going striking and coming back and uh, your double base systems can be used over a longer range so if you see your tv remotes that uh, you can operate it from quite a bit of a distance but if you talk about your ir sensors which are being used in your robots in your robotic arms you will see that it has to be placed very low close to the surface close to the ground if it is a bit high the sensation does not works properly that is the reason because your your single base system have a very small range of operation whereas your uh, double base system have a very high range of operation Proximity sensors, as I have given you an example already of your uh, left toes. So, which is uh, basically used to detect the presence of nearby objects without any physical contact. There is no physical contact because there is always a range, there is always a gap. Have you ever seen that uh, the dose of the lift comes and strikes you and then it again separates? No. It, it, from a distance only, the lift door stops and again it opens. So proximity sensors are always used to sense the sensation of an object, the presence of an object from a distance. Now the distance will differ as per the type of the proximity sensor being used. And I'll show you. So there are four types. One is the inductive type, capacitive type, ultrasonic type, and optical type. If the range is too high, if the range is too high, then you'll be going for your ultrasonic type or your optical type proximity sensors. But if you're working in small ranges, the, if the range is small, in that case, you can go for inductive type or your capacitive type. And um, generally, if you're going for sensation of, uh, you know, certain such objects uh, whereby, uh, you know, the, there might be a corrosion, a corrosion activity or there might be an explosion activity. In that case, maxi in maximum cases, we go for our ultrasonic type so that from a range only we can detect something as such. But uh, if it is a normal activity, day-to-day -day activity that, uh, that does not cause any hazard or something, in that case, you'll be going for your inductive type or your capacitive type. So in your inductive proximity sensor, you have you are again having four types. That is 12 mm shielded. So 12 mm shielded means the range is of 12 mm. So from 12 mm uh, of the surface of this proximity sensor, this is the surface of the proximity sensor. So 12 mm distance, from any 12 mm distance, if there's any object, this can be detected. Anything beyond this 12 mm range won't be detected. 18 mm, 18 mm shorty. So this is uh, this the range of this particular inductive type will be of 18 mm. Then again, you have 18 mm unshielded. So the range remains the same, but it is an unshielded one. And then you have 30, uh, 30 mm smooth barrel. So in maximum, maximum cases, we use this 30 mm smooth barrel because it has a good range. And at the same time, it is totally covered. It is totally shielded. In your normal project applications, uh, you know, uh, like um, you know, BTEC level projects that you make, in that case, uh, you will be mostly mostly finding your 12 mm shielded or your 18 mm shorty. These are capacitive type proximity sensors, so it is totally on the um, like uh, capacitance uh, being developed between the surface. So the this plate of uh, your sensor proximity sensor will be acting as one surface and the target will be acting as the other surface and in between these two surfaces basically a capacitance grows and accordingly the response is being detected the ultrasonic proximity sensors as i have told you it is for a long range so uh, once the signals are sent um, this is a beam angle so anything in the beam angle if it strikes it will come back and accordingly uh, the sensor will respond As I have told you, uh, inductive and capacitive type sensors have distance limitations. Um, when the distance of the object uh, and the sensor is more, ultrasonic proximity sensors are used. Analog inputs, you have uh, your temperature sensors. First of all, as I have told you, uh, this is the RTD, the thermocouples, thermistors, and the pyrometers. So pyrometer is the most common example that uh, we, people are aware of nowadays after this COVID-19 scenario because uh, everywhere you go, you go for a thermal scanner. 
anywhere you enter into a class and you first of all you have to go for thermal screening uh, you and uh, you go to some malls you go to any banks you have to go for thermal screening and those thermal scanners that you have uh, in, in all the offices and in all the places this is nothing but basically it is a pyrometer apart from that rtds uh, there is a resistance temperature detector which is a unimetal system <coughs> so rtds are generally a unimetal system uh, every type of uh, metal has a uh, unique compo composition and has a different resistance to the flow of electrical current. Now, I'll give you a common example like platinum, right? Uh, in a RTD, I'll be giving you a common example that is platinum, PT. We generally call it to be a PT100, right? PT100. And uh, if you see, it is generally written as 385. 385 PT100. Why? Because PT100, because uh, at uh, 0 degree centigrade, you will be having 100 ohms of resistance uh, with your platinum. And with every degree rise in the temperature, with every degree rise in the temperature, you, there will be a change in 0 0.385 ohms of resistance. So the temperature is being scaled. Like, see, uh, again, over here, we are not uh, transforming directly a physical quantity into an electrical quantity in terms of current or in terms of voltage. We are transforming, we are taking the accountability of resistance out over here. So as we know from Ohm's law, basic Ohm's law, we know that it is V is equals to IR. We know that it is V is equals to IR. So from that, what we are doing is that we are not going for direct transformation of uh, temperature into current. We are generally comparing the, the temperature with our resistance. We, com we are comparing our temperature with our resistance. So once we are comparing our temperature with our resistance, well, we're comparing our temperature with, uh, with our resistance, what is, what is happening is that we find that if platinum is the metal, platinum has a property that at zero degree centigrade, the, uh, the resistance will be of 100 ohms, right? And as the temperature increases by one degree, there will be change in the uh, ohmic resistance of 0 0.385 ohms for, per degree rise in the temperature. So temperature is being related with resistance and accordingly, then we'll be fi uh, finding the value of the, we're basically measuring the temperature, but in terms of resistance and we know the calculated formula because we know the relation between uh, the rise of temperature and the change in resistance. So this is the coil resistance element, this is the connector wires and the core. So as I, as I was telling that we have a relation. So this is the relation over here. This is RT is equals to R naught with um, bracket one plus A T minus T naught. Right. So A is a constant. That is point triple zero nine eight is the constant. And apart from that, resistance at temperature uh, T naught. T naught is the initial temperature. So we generally take it to be zero degree centigrade. Whereas RT is resistance at a temperature. That is at a high temperature at the current measuring temperature. You can see that the most common material used, as I have given you the example of platinum, that is PT100 I have given you. Apart from that, you have nickel, co copper, balco, and tungsten. But generally, we, in the industry, in the industrial sector, we maximum find that it is PT100 being used. Thermocouple, yes, uh, obviously thermocouple uh, is a combination of two metals, uh, whereby we have a cold junction and a hot junction. And accordingly, the comparison that is, you can see the metal A and metal B. So there are two metals in the study and then according to the comparisons of uh, hold, hot junction and cold junction we find the temperature difference and accordingly it is being measured this is a thermocouple if you see so you have a hot junction point and uh, and you have a cold junction point. this is a pair of dissimilar wires dissimilar wire means the two different metals of two different properties Types of thermocouples you have uh, J type, K type, and S type. And uh, why you have this uh, differences because uh, you want different ranges of temperatures to be measured. So if you see over here, uh, this is I type J is iron and constantine, right? Iron and constantine. In this, if you see, it is about minus 250 to minus 850, minus 250 to minus 850, right? So up to 800 degrees centigrade is the like uh, this is the maximum range that we are talking about 
and type k is chrome and aluminium so it is again an alloy basically in which it is the range is from minus 250 to 1150 and in type s it is platinum and uh, it is platinum platinum alloy two types of platinum uh, with different impurity content are being mixed to form an alloy and over here if you see the temperature range it is quite vast starting from minus 200 uh, 200 to 1850 so platinum uh, as i have suggested um, for you people in rtd also in a similar case in thermocouples also you will be seeing that platinum has a very wide range of temperature and, and a very wide range of temperature can be measured through platinum so we generally prefer platinum over other metals Mister, they are made up of a small piece of semiconductor material the material uh, is a spe uh, special because the resistance changes a lot for a small change in temperature and so can be made into a small sensor and it costs less than a platinum wire so thermistors you will be generally finding in your electronic circuits there are small uh, you know semiconductor uh, like small uh, semiconductor materials through uh, and it has a property that uh, due to very small change in uh, resistance uh, sorry in very small change in temperature there will be very large change in the resistance so the measurement becomes very easy So these are the basic relationship if you look into the resistance and temperature r is equal to k into t so basically resistance is directly proportional to the temperature in most of the cases pyrometer I have, as i have already given you the example uh, pyrometer you can see that uh, it is being used everywhere now so didn't explain much into it so you can generally uh, check the surface temperature or you can take the void temperature but you didn't make a contact you can take it from a distance as you do with the thermal scanners in terms of level sensor the inductive type capacitive type conductive type and ultrasonic type the so level sensors are again used for measuring the level of the liquid now this is the analog sensor initially we were discussing about the float switch in the float switch in the float sensor we are saying that when it reaches a particular level then only the detection will come that is zeros or ones will be the response but over here in level sensor we can measure the level of the liquid at any point that is it is it is starting from the zeroth range to the hundred percent range so this level sensor will give you the uh, indication of the level of liquid being filled in a particular tank at any point of time These are the inductive in the inductive type. Obviously, the phenomenon will be of um, in a mutual induction. Over here, you can see that uh, see the level is being filled, and accordingly, it is being indicated. So this is the inductive type. This is due to the coil, the coil that is uh, like uh, over here, and uh, this level uh, level uh, the correspondence with the uh, with the coil it generates an electrical signal, and accordingly, we can get the reading of the tank being filled. most common type that you will be finding is the dip type this dip type is the most common type of level sensor that you generally find in the industries it acts as a capacitance basically it uh, this is a capacitive type it creates a capacitance right so this is a non-conducting insulating medium this is not this should be non-conducting and if it is a conducting uh, medium in that case you generally go for your ultrasonic types again like suppose in a petroleum industry in a petroleum overhead tanks you do not go for dip type like uh, you do not go with rod, rod type of uh, level sensors you generally go for your ultrasonic type of level sensors these are only uh, feasible if uh, suppose you are going for any non uh, conductive type insulating uh, medium in that if you are dipping then only you can measure like normal liquid uh, that is your distilled water or something as such you want to measure the level of the distilled water and in that case you can go for with your dip type so these are the different types of level sensors being shown over here used to measure the level of various types of liquids and uh, based on the types of liquids only you need to make a choice of the sensor being used type of rather the type of sensor being used these are the normal calculations uh, based on which uh, you can go for 
like uh, if you go details into it as to how we are making the calculations how we are making the calibrations basically uh, this is said to be the scaling because uh, see uh, we are going with an analog type of level measuring in which we are measuring from 0 to 100 uh, percent of the level and that needs to be transformed into a electro electrical signal and the electrical signal ranges between 4 to 20 milliamps so obviously we have to go for a scaling part we have to go for a calibration part so that calibration as to how we are doing that is the uh, calculation which we can go in details advantages of having a capacitive type level sensor which is the most common it is relatively inexpensive versatile it is reliable the measurement is quite accurate it requires uh, minimal maintenance yes so since uh, it is dipped in the liquid and uh, the liquid is non-volatile sort of a nature so it does not require much of a maintenance as such contains no moving parts yes in the in this part of a level sensor you don't have any in the capacitive type you don't have any moving part easy to install and can be adapted easily for different size of the vessels uh, yes because it is only a dip, a dip type of a rod so you can dip it anywhere so it does not uh, it does not matter rather uh, as to what is the shape of the vessel and accordingly you need to think as to how uh, it has to be fitted good range of measurements from few centimeters to 100 meters so uh, like you have a good range of measure, measurement as well based on the length of the dip of the rod but generally for very high uh, measurements like uh, as it is mentioned as 100 meters you generally do not go for uh, your dip type because it is it becomes a bit expensive in that case we generally go for your ultrasonic type itself so the applications if you see in applications you'll be finding the capacitive level probes are used uh, for measuring the level of liquids <coughs> powder all, all granular contents liquid metals at very high temperatures so if it is a liquid metal in that you cannot dip so in the in the uh, like uh, you cannot dip directly what you have to do is that uh, like this liquid metals at very high temperature you have to be very cautious about like uh, what is the level of heat that uh, my sensor rod can absorb so there, uh, it, uh, it is not as if that directly you can take a decision yes uh, at this particular temperature i can dip my rod so this liquid metal uh, at very high temperature you have to be very cautious about before going for a capacitive type of uh, level sensor then you have a float switches uh, that i have already explained to you so uh, i'm not going for the repetition of the thing The ultrasonic type, as it has already been explained, that uh, if it is a volatile sort of a content, we won't be going for your dip type. In, in that case, we'll be going for ultrasonic type. So ultrasonic, if you see, this is the ultrasonic transducer. <coughs> and it's sending it ultra, ultrasonic signals. That it is a tank wall and is the level of the liquid. So once it strikes the level of the liquid, again, it responds back. This is being received and accordingly, the signal is being sent out. So based on the traveling time of the ultrasonic waves, we can determine as to what is the percentage of liquid that has been filled. So in this, there is no direct contact of the sensor, body, and the uh, liquid, whereas we are making the measurement. But if you see in the previous case, in the dip type, there was a direct contact of the metal uh, body, of the, of the sensor body, with the liquid. So if it is a volatile liquid, if it is a like, you know, reactive part of a liquid, we will be always bringing this ultrasonic transition, which is the safest one. This is a conductive type level sensor, the last type. So conductive type level sensors are ideal for the point level de detection of a wide range of conductive liquids such as water and especially um, well suited for high corrosive liquids such as caustic soda, hydrochloric acid. So any type of, uh, you, you know, 
if there is a corrosive liquid as i've told you uh, about the corrosive liquids in that you'll be going for a conductive tail level synthesis So you can see in uh, any reactors or any react, uh, nuclear tanks, in that cases, you generally go for your conductive pair level sensors. So the, any, any chemical processes uh, in the chemical industries will be finding maximum type of uh, level sensors will be of your conductive type. So you can see over here the level sensors being dipped. So these are the level sensors which are di which are dipped in the tank for measuring the level. <coughs> a flow sensor, uh, obviously, flow sensor is a device which is used for measuring the rate of the flow of the liquid. So in this, we generally call it to be the flow transmitters. Why flow transmitters? Because what is happening is that the the flow uh, sensor is sensing the uh, rate of the flow of the liquid which has been transformed into electrical signal and finally that electrical signal is being again amplified with the help of the transmitter. Types of flow meters, differential pressure flow meters. Next is the magnetic flow meters, which is the most common type magnetic flow meters. We generally use it because of the economical part and at the same time it is easy to use and variable area flow meters variable area flow meters is basically the rotameter in the rotom uh, this rotameter is also a very important part in the industrial applications if you uh, like uh, you can see the daily supply of water to your house from uh, some nearby you know uh, water treatment plants in the water treatment plants if you see the level of the control of the flow of the water is being generally done with the help of a rotameter Inferential uh, type flow meters. Inferential type flow meters. This is the turbine uh, turbine type or the rotating vane type. So uh, in this uh, flow meters, basically you do not go for the measuring of liquid flows. Rather, it is for the me measuring of the fluid flows. Like suppose the rate of flow of air or rate of flow of any gas. So for that, you generally go for your inferential type. Positive displacement flow meter that is the propeller type and it is basically based on a diaphragm it is basically based on a diaphragm in which the movement of the diaphragm uh, the displacement the amount of displacement in the in the diaphragm uh, helps you measure as to what is the rate of flow if uh, there is major displacement in the in the diaphragm uh, then that goes to show that the rate of flow is high whether if uh, whereas if uh, the diaphragm uh, the displacement of the diaphragm is very less it goes to suggest that the rate of flow is also less Ultrasonic flow meter, yes, again the same thing uh, with the help of ultrasonic waves, it has been directed, but though the use is very less. So these are the different types of uh, flow meters. Uh, as um, discussed, so we can go into, into the details uh, if uh, we get some time as well, because there's a shortage of time, so I won't be going into the details of uh, all the senses one by one. Rather, I'll be taking you to a part that is the PID. These are all the flow meters. Apart from the flow meters, I'll be taking you to a part that is said to be the PID. That is a proportion integral part in which you can go through the slides that I'll be sharing with. So this is oh, the pressure sensor before going to the PID. I'll be just discussing the pressure sensor once. The pressure sensor is basically again for measuring the uh, pressure. You have your uh, you know C type board and tubes and all this for uh, measuring your pressures. So uh, basically, you go for your if, if you are going to your British units, you go for uh, your PSIs or in your metric systems, you measure it in Pascals. So again, it is a, it is a physical quantity measurement, but uh, the signals that we are receiving is again in the form of electrical signals so the types as i have told you it is the bottom tube the major type that you see there and apart from that you have bellows you have capsules and you have diaphragms so diaphragms again the same thing they, according to the moment of uh, the there is a displacement of the diaphragm uh, you can 
sense as to what is the pressure being exerted. So this is the Borden tube, basically the C-type Borden tube that you talk about. This uh, you generally find in your scalars, uh, in your scalars. If you are measuring it, uh, like if you're, if you're not measuring it digitally, if you're measuring it in an analog meter, in the analog meter, most of the uh, like pressure sensors that uh, you find for sensing the pressure is your Borden tube types. Even uh, in your, uh, like, uh, you know, the, you'll be seeing the filling of air in your vehicles for that you'll be finding that there is a small uh, you know meter through which you check the pressure of uh, in the tires for that case also you go for your uh, c type border tube you see the internal structure of your c type border tube this uh, there's a teeth and and as the pressure uh, the pressure increases this teeth will shift and accordingly the, the this extension there will be the extension in the c will increase so if the extension in the c increases there will be a there will be a stretch and according to the stretch the the needle moves the there will be needle above this and according to that the needle moves so at this point uh, if you see uh, on the other side if you'll be having a needle so as uh, the stretches as there is a stretch out over here in the teeth part this will pull the system and according to the amount of pull that is being exerted that is being exerted on the system the, the position of the needle will also change in the meter here you can see it according to this uh, change see according to this uh, position uh, change in the position of this teeth there will be stretch and this stretch will make this needle to rotate and accordingly you can note the reading that the corresponding reading will be noted The bellows, bellow, um, bellow types uh, elements are constructed of tubular membranes that are convoluted around the circumference. So around the circumference, if you are talking about, uh, like I'll show you the structure that will be, see. This is the bellows. So as they, uh, there is an expression, like if you are uh, putting a pressure over here, there will be contraction or there will be a radiofraction. Based on the contraction or radiofraction, the needle will move. See, if it, if it, if it contracts, what will happen the needle will move on the upper side and accordingly the corresponding reading is again noted so this is the bellow technique the pressure is being applied from this side due to the pressure the, there is a contraction and due to the contraction as the pressure increases the needle moves and accordingly you can see that this is the uh, particular reading or this much amount of pascals of pressure is being applied on the system So this is, this is another example of a bellow type whereby the air is entering and uh, entering and uh, enter, uh, from this side uh, your air enters and over here the nozzle the nozzle is generally closed and as the amount of air ex uh, entering into the system increases there will be expansion in the bellows next is a diaphragm as i've uh, told you again i'll be showing you through the image see over here the diaphragm as uh, there is a motion as there is a pressure being applied the, obviously there will be change in the position of the diaphragm membranes and uh, this flexible as uh, there is a change in the position of this flexible membrane it goes to suggest that the pressure being exerted on the system increases next quantity is the speed so speed obviously we know that uh, we have our speedometers so it is a very common example in all the vehicles we saw see our speedometers so that is the most uh, common type of example that we can find for measuring our uh, speed uh, speed and this is said to be your speed transducers it might be of optical type yes obviously nowadays we have optical type of uh, speed sensors that is uh, we use optical encoders basically for measuring the speeds and this optical en uh, encoders you'll be finding in almost all the uh, motors nowadays you, uh, you use your uh, if you talk about your uh, like different types of motors that you are using in the industries that is your servo motors basically the most common example your servo motors in the servo uh, motor systems you are always finding an encoder which checks if the servo motor is performing a perfect function and accordingly it responds for the servo servo uh, rotations for the step rotations in that case you have your uh, encoders that encoders generally is generally placed to check the error signals and to make the corrections and those all those encoders are generally of your optical type encoders 
so that optical type encoder is generally used for detecting your speed valuations so i think uh, the seven parameters that we have started off uh, i have discussed as i uh, in the initial level i have talked about the stachometers for measuring the speed this is used in your normal ac motors that uh, that is your uh, induction type motors if you want to measure the speed you can go for your tachometers so with this i think uh, i've co covered almost the seven parameters that we have started with uh, though they are much into your uh, sensors and uh, actuators part which is uh, like very vast to be covered within one hour the certain highlights that i have given to you you may study more into it and if you have anything more to know you may obviously come back to me and for the uh, time being we i think for it's time so we can close off and if you have any questions you may come up with the questions please hello sir yeah hello sir yeah yeah sir thank you thank you so much sir um I received one uh, question. If suppose there is yep. a uh, two type of sensor like uh, analog, analog and digital. Yep. So, so what is the uh, comparison between these two analog and digital uh, sensor by the accuracy? Means which one is uh, more accurate for measuring the parameter? Um, <laughs> right. uh, so, um, see, um, uh, if you talk, uh, talk in terms of accuracy. This is something uh, where we are missing the link. Uh, let let me come uh, come up from the initial level. See, if you want to have uh, the responses of the system in terms of zeros and ones, that is on and off. Like I'll give you a simple example to understand. That is, uh, suppose you are having a fan. Now, if you want this fan uh, in your house just to rotate or not to rotate, for that case, you generally have a switch. Right. Yes. Uh, through the switch, you switch on the fan or you switch off the fan. But if you want to control the speed of rotation of this particular fan, then generally you go for a regulator or a dimmer. Right. So this regulator or dimmer is giving you an analogous function. That is rotation at different speeds. But the switch is only giving you a facility to either to rotate or not to rotate. So it's not in terms of accuracy that you can compare between digital and analog. It, it's in terms of applications. It's in terms of applications that you have to compare. And if you want really compare in terms of accuracy, then first of all, you have to see the application. What is the application? Like suppose I talk about uh, your overhead tank. In your overhead tank, you want that I should know as to what is the level of water being filled or what is the amount of water that is remaining in my tank. So in that case, you cannot go for a float sensor, which is a digital sensor. In that case, you have to go for a level sensor. But if you want only that if my tank is full or if my tank is empty, I want an error signal to generate, I want an alarm to generate, in that case, you can go for a float signal. So that is giving you the vulnerability to choose between digital and analog based on the application wanted. Now, you have, since that you have chosen that, no, I want the level to be measured at all the levels, at all the points. So that means you have to go for a level sensor, that is an analog sensor. Now, in that level sensor, now for accuracy part, you have to then choose whether I want to go for inductive type, I want to go for capacitive type, I want to go for ultrasonic type. So that will give you the accuracy uh, part of the reading. Like your ultrasonic sensors are the most accurate uh, to be called in the industries. I hope uh, I'm clear with my answer. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. And uh, one more uh, question. Uh, uh, what will be the period uh, how means how to calibrate this uh, sensor it suppose some uh, after some operations or after some year how we yes. can again check the accuracy of that sensor or how to calibrate see uh, that, that is generally based on the zero error that we call it to be uh, normally we, we go for the zero error calculations uh, to check whether uh, the sensor is working uh, perfect, perfectly or not if it is an analog sensor and if it is it is a digital sensor it is very simple we have to either go for uh, zeros or ones if it is detecting zeros and ones uh, perfectly that is no and nc contact are working perfectly for that particular sensor then in digital sensor we have no absolutely no issues but in analog case we generally go uh, with the calculation of the sc uh, scaling that is the zero error checking in zero error checking you have a standard de uh, deviations uh, you, uh, that standard deviations uh, are based on the the uh, readings that is the minimum value and the maximum value of the system and the minimum value and the maximum value being chosen by the operator right so uh, th that is mean deviation being calculated by the system and mean deviation being uh, assumed by the operator based on that we calculate the standard deviation and if that is got to be zero then we say that the sensor is uh, 
that the analog sensor is working perfectly right okay thank you sir uh thank you uh, sir for delivering such uh, information about the uh, system parameters sensors switches and control devices okay uh, i hope uh, people get more uh, clarification about the sensors and actuators so i uh, again thankful to behalf of parallel university uh, thank you sir thank you thank you very much sir and thank you students for your patient uh, hearing and thanks for the questions that you have come up with hope okay. to meet you again thank you thank you sir thank you